Uh, this oh. is session 3.1 of the uh, LARA ASSA conference uh, titled The Old Gig Economy, the Extent of Payroll Fraud in Construction, Its Cost to Society, and Approaches to Its Regulation. Um, welcome. Uh, we have a, a remarkable set of uh, presenters, in my opinion. Uh, people with extensive uh, academic and scholarly research <laughs> backgrounds, uh, leaders in policy formation and uh, public service. And uh, it's, it's an honor to be chairing this session. So uh, for those of you who are uh, coming on board uh, as our uh, audience, um, you, will, you will note that there is a Q&A uh, item and the menu at the bottom. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, questions to submit for the question and answer at the end of this, uh, please uh, place them there and I'll do my best to uh, organize and present them to uh, the panel uh, when we get to that part. Um, the, I am, uh, uh, as soon as I stop talking, I'm going to post to the uh, to the uh, chat room a uh, a link to a uh, to a site that will have documents uh, and biographies and more information uh, relating to uh, this uh, this session and to the panelists, and so uh, you can use that to access all of that information. Thus, my, uh, my oral introduction and, uh, of the uh, uh, panelists and presenters uh, will be uh, uh, quite a bit more brief than the information you can get from the uh, written bios that are there. And, uh, and those are worth reading, as well as other supplementary documents. Uh, in addition, there will be uh, slide stacks uh, that have been uh, submitted and uploaded to that site. Uh, that said, um, uh, we have, and I'll do this in alphabetical order before we get started. Uh, Catherine Graham is here, who is a professor of economics and survey methodology at the University of Maryland, uh, formerly chair of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking and a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and a commissioner in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, she's elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a distinguished fellow of the AEA, Dale Bellman is a professor at uh, Michigan State University. He's uh, done extensive uh, research on uh, the effects of unions and labor market regulation. Uh, a book just among others, uh, What Does Minimum Wage Do from 2014. Uh, recently uh, did an article, Rebuilding Residential Construction with um, Ornston, Brockman and Hinkle published in Creating Good Jobs an MIT 2020 uh, book. Mark Ehrlich uh, is uh, a Wortham Fellow at Harvard's Law School on work-life programs and labor uh, since 2017 when he retired as Executive Secretary of the New England Regional Council of the Carpenters Union and was Vice President of the Massachusetts uh, AFL-CIO, Massachusetts Building Trades, and was a member of the Federal Reserve Bank Advisory Council He's authored a number of books, including uh, With Our Hands, The Story of Carpenters in Massachusetts and Labor at the Ballot Box. But he, I know him best by dozens of uh, essays, articles, and uh, labor history uh, articles in uh, ac various academic uh, publications. No, no. Honor to have him here. Uh, Matt Capiz is an attorney and representative of the General President of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners. Uh, specializes in, in employment, tax fraud, and work compensation issues, fraud and wage theft in the construction industry. Uh, he's received any number of awards, including uh, the Kim Presbury Award from the Workers' Injury Law and Advocacy Group. And in uh, 2018, he received the Samuel Gompers Award for the from the International Association of Industrial Accident Boards and Commissions. 
Uh, Rebecca Smith is here as director of the Work Structures Portfolio at the National Endowment Law Project. And with her uh, team of associates, she focuses on the growing use of contracting arrangements like mislabeling workers as independent contractors and use of staffing firms. Uh, they work to develop and implement innovative policy solutions to ensure that work provides working people with stability, safety, and the opportunity to contribute to each other. David Weil is Dean and Professor of the Heller School of Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. And prior to that, he was appointed by President Obama to be Administrator of the Wage and Hour Division of the US Department of Labor and was the first Senate confirmed head of that agency in a decade, advising government agencies on state and federal levels and international organizations on labor and workplace policies. Author of more than 125 articles and five books and very important and relative, uh, relevant to this session, the much honored and recognized fissured workplace. Uh, and then, oh, there's myself. I'm a professor emeritus at uh, Middle Tennessee State University. I'm on the Lara Council and I chair the National Chapter Advisory Committee. And my own research has appeared in a number of labor and employment relations journals, such as the International Relations, uh, Industrial Relations Research Review and the Journal of Collective Negotiations in the Public Sector. I won't dwell on that because we have a lot to do. Um, our agenda calls for us to begin with Mark Ehrlich. And so I will, Mark, you're, you're number one, and I turn this over to you. Thank you. If, if you have anything to, uh, to post, uh, we, you can share your screen. I've made that available. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bill. And, and it's nice to see everybody uh, on, the, uh, on the panel. Um, I will... Uh, do the screen share now, if I can. Whoops. Oh, my. Hold on. Um, for some reason, it isn't picking it up. Let me try again. I'm sorry. I apologize, I thought this was all set. Okay, let me try it again now. Hmm. Can you see it? Can, can everybody see it? Yep, it's good. Okay, thank you. All right, so I apologize for that uh, 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 tech. Um, obviously that's not my strong suit, but anyway, um, this whole issue of uh, the, uh, the, the question of misclassification um, that uh, was, is something actually that I did not come to as an academic, I came to uh, as a labor official, I was elected uh, to head up my local in 1992 in the wake of the recession. And as we all know, recessions end up uh, creating uh, new forms of uh, work organization. After I was elected, I walked non-union jobs and talked to carpenters who told me that on a Friday they were an employee and on Monday they had somehow become an independent contractor. They didn't understand it, um, but it was they were working for the same company doing the same wor uh, work. And I began to understand, this was uh, all new to me, and I began to understand that uh, misclassification was clearly a threat to union jobs as a union representative and, uh, and to legitimate employers. But I also understood fairly quickly when I would talk to regulatory agencies who were kind of, uh, who knew nothing about this or little about it, that I needed to frame the problem as a public policy issue rather than as a union, non-union matter in order to get, um, legislative support for activity and regulatory support in order to crack down on the problem. I understood it was illegal um, and un certainly unethical. Uh, but, and so that was where I first met uh, fellow panelist David, 
when we did in 2004 a study at Harvard uh, on misclassification in which uh, uh, I won't go into the details on that, but basically it's, it, uh, it was a, the first study of many that have since followed indicating what the uh, economic consequences of misclassification in the construction industry are. And as everybody here knows, they are dire. But I, um, so, to, so that's my own personal experience with, having, with this issue. But uh, as I have spent more time uh, studying the problem, I understand now the broader context and that the current debate that is focused largely on the gig economy, on ride sharing, and the changing nature of work and misclassification and the role of independent contracting and the whole uh, the controversy over the passage of AB5 in California and the unfortunate uh, victory of Proposition 22 in November, that now it is much larger. But what many people don't know who focus on this question of the gig economy, they think that this issue suddenly popped up uh, with the with the emergence of the gig economy, whereas in, in construction, it dates back decades and is part of larger social and economic changes that are part of the breakdown of formalized labor relations uh, dating back to the 70s and 80s. And the issue that David knows well about the fissuring uh, in an industry with a long tradition of subcontracting. Why is construction particularly susceptible to the issue of misclassification? Well, first of all, there are a significant number of genuine independent contractors that operate uh, in the industry. You know, the plumber who comes to your house who, who uh, fixes your water heater and goes home and does the books and it's his own business and he is truly an independent contractor. Um, they're all, uh, so, so that structure pre-existed the issue of misclassification. In addition, um, I uh, have always called the uh, construction industry the original gig economy because workers move from job to job, from company to company, and each job really is a gig. Each project starts and it ends. And so in recessions, when there is a, always a search for cost-cutting measures because the pie shrinks and material costs are stable and the same for everyone, labor costs are the only way to really get a competitive advantage and misclassification offers a substantial savings, 25 to 30, 35% in labor cost savings. So uh, by the elimination of state and federal tax obligations as well as workers' comp insurance premiums. But the, the context for all of this, the way to understand, I think the role of misclassification construction is really goes back to the late 60s with the formation of the Construction Users Anti-Inflation Roundtable which later uh, became known as the Business Roundtable in 1972, an organization that most people here are quite familiar with. But it started as a group of Fortune 500 companies that were uh, upset about the increasing cost of construction for capital uh, plants and factories that they were building. And they launched what I would call the Owner's Revenge, which was a multi-pronged attack on union power. They uh, were operating under the assumption that uh, excessive union power was, a, was the source of the high cost of construction during the late 60s. And so what happened is we saw an industry in transition. There was a realignment of interest. Um, the construction manager emerged uh, uh, as opposed to the general contractor where the loyalty was to, was to the owner, not to the subcontractors that they had historically had long-term relationships. Uh, this construction manager works for a fee, not a lump sum bid, and then and sheds responsibility for direct hires as opposed to the, the general contractor. Between 1967 and 1997 in this period, general contractors actually cut their share of direct construction work employment from 35 to 24% of the labor force, whereas the specialist subcontractors portion increased from 48 to 63%. So you had a shift of uh, the, the, uh, the large scale contractors, the general contractors, construction managers, whatever term you uh, prefer to use, that they were becoming increasingly known as briefcase contractors, that they were simply subcontracting out the work and no longer got involved in the whole issue of direct hires. And the result is that as was uh, uh, noted in a 2000 industry textbook, that the era in which uh, general contractors perform significant amounts of work with their own forces is largely over. And, the, and why is this important? Because the reduction of direct hires is strongly correlated with the rise of the use of independent contractors. 
That was happening on the ind industry side. On the legislative side, there were attempts. This was also driven by the Business Roundtable. Uh, the Business Roundtable was very much part of the transition from general contracting to um, construction management because they wanted the loyalty to them. Uh, but they also engaged in a legislative program in which they attempt to repeal the federal Davis-Bacon law and many Davis-Bacon state laws. They were never able to succeed or uh, repeal at the federal level, but nine states during the decade between 79 and 1989 repealed state prevailing wage laws and six more have since then. And the result is that today, 24 states in the union had never had or now have no prevailing wage law. Uh, this was very much part of a um, uh, very consciously coordinated effort uh, that was funded by the Business Roundtable and the creation of the ABC, uh, the Organization of Non-Union Contractors. There was also a similar and more successful federal uh, 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 legislative accomplishment, which was uh, the uh, se Section 530 of the, of the IRS Code of 1978, which was called the Safe Harbor provision. And what that did is it uh, uh, provided a safe harbor to companies that had been misclassifying so that they could continue to do so without any fear of being audited um, and penalized uh, as a result simply of having a safe harbor for, for it being a past practice. And uh, this has been maybe the single most uh, disastrous impact on the issue of enforcement misclassification, because in many ways, the IRS is really the, the one single agency that could have had the uh, biggest impact on reversing this trend and actually did next to nothing. Uh, in 2014, after decades of the safe harbor being in place, a high ranking revenue officer uh, was interviewed by a magazine and looking back said it's gotten widely out of control with the results of section 530, it's the wild west out there. And then there was a whole legal apparatus in which um, uh, the combination of the uh, construction management section 530 and the immigrant uh, immigration reform law in 86 resulted in a cottage industry of lawyers, accountants, and consultants who went around the country advising uh, construction employers, contractors, how to move their people from the, the payrolls to independent contracting. Uh, and there was a creation of independent contracting contracts to paper this activity. The 2001 uh, ABA Construction Lawyers Gu Guide included a five-page boilerplate independent contracting agreement to be used. And if you think that, that what difference does that make to simply paper it, because the work, the underlying work relations hadn't changed, people were still taking direction and control from foremen and superintendents and were working the same way they had been. They were clearly not functioning as independent contractors. And yet, uh, uh, you know, judges and um, respected the fact that there was this, this papering process. Just one example is a 1998 federal judge in Pennsylvania ruled that despite all other indicators, the document alone saying that the, the guy had signed because he had to in order to work, uh, tipped the scale decidedly in favor of the conclusion that Mulzett, which was his name, was an independent contractor, simply having a document there. At the same time that the growth of immigration is happening and the construction industry really began in many ways in the South in the, in the 80s and 1984 was one of the first studies uh, indicating that in Houston, there was a large, uh, that one third of the, of the workforce was from Mexico and Central and South America. Uh, the, the, the growth of that workforce um, increased dramatically over the next few decades. Uh, between 1990 and, and 2000, the proportion of Hispanic male workers in construction increased four times as fast as the increase of white male workers. And by the end of 2006, nearly a third of recently arrived foreign born Hispanics working, were working in construction. So I mean, that, this was the, the occupation and industry of choice for many of the new migrants uh, to the United States. By 2014, undocumented immigrants made up 15% of the net total national construction workforce, actually outnumbering immigrant workers with valid working papers. So uh, this is really um, has become as uh, the, the uh, complete transformation of the workforce in one generation. Again, why is this important? Because uh, they were, most of those workers were initially classified as independent contractors. And then many employers decided 
Why even bother going through the process of uh, all the paperwork of independent contracting and issuing 1099s? I'm just going to simply pay cash because I'm dealing with a group of workers who are unlikely to protest because of their um, uh, uh, the dangers of their uh, of being deported. So, what's the result of this? In in 2013-17, uh, Workers Defense Project did a series of studies in which they concluded that half of Texas's construction workforce was foreign board, one third documented across the South. And further north, in New York, 2010. Uh, Building Congress estimated that 45% of the city's trade workers were not citizens. The Fiscal Policy Institute reported that two-thirds of the workforce in New York's affordable housing industry either worked as independent contractors or were paid off the books in cash. One example that I was very familiar with in 2007, when I was the head of the New England Regional Council of Carpenters, we filed for an NLRB election with National Carpentry, a Connecticut-based wood framing company that was the largest wood framing uh, contractor in New England at the time. When we filed for election, we did this basically in order to flush out the fact that he misclassified his employees. So of course he responded that he never employed any employees. And to its eternal um, discredit, the NLRB regional office concluded that the fact that the employer may have exercised some supervisory authority over the employees or that it may have paid employees directly or participated in their hiring or set their initial wage rates or provided them with tool does not, however, provide conclusive evidence that it was the employer alone who employed them. I mean, it, this, was kind of, this was kind of unbelievable. You had hundreds of workers out there on job sites and uh, apparently they were leprechauns because uh, work was getting done, but nobody employed them. So the owner told the board that the real employers were a group of 14 subcontractors and when the board sent subpoenas to the addresses of these subcontractors, all were returned as undeliverable. So how did people respond? On the union side, as I said, in 2004, we did a study at Harvard, um, and there was a series of, of, of parallel studies at the state level to establish the economic consequences of misclassification. There was an extensive lobbying campaigns for more effective laws and enforcement of employment laws uh, to crack down on misclassification. There were responsible contractor ordinances and language and private agreements. There were hiring of multilingual organizers at the local and regional levels to engage directly with these, uh, this workforce and coalitions with worker centers, community organization and immigrant advocacy, advocacy groups. Uh, and one example is uh, one, of the, one of the discussions today was hired as a full-time staffer dedicated to misclassification by the Carpenters Union in 2013. On the regulatory side, there was an increased use of the ABC test. It was, uh, was used, it passed in 2004 in Massachusetts and 2019 in California, AB5, which uh, sadly is now uh, rideshare uh, drivers and delivery drivers have been exempted as a result of Proposition 22. Interagency task force, since you have multiple groups, you have uh, the departments of revenue, you have the unemployment uh, insurance, you, uh, you have a workers' compensation fraud. You have a series of, of uh, agencies. All are impacted by misclassification in terms of lost revenues. And you have uh, an increasing use of co-enforcement, a term that Janice Fine developed to, uh, in which agencies partnered with unions, worker centers, and high road employers to uh, <clears throat> get more data and information about practices on the ground uh, and, to, and to, to develop joint strategies. Uh, and then there was the whole question of how do you deal with the shift from misclassification to cash compensation because it becomes much more difficult uh, for any kind of forensic audit to track it. at least with misclassification you have 1099s with cash compensation you have no records whatsoever. Uh, then there was the Perez Wild tenure at DOL uh, where David uh, 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 set up a bunch of memorandums of understanding between DOL and state enforcement agencies and issued very strong opinion letters on independent contracting and joint employment <clears throat> and pushed a strategic enforcement model um, that, uh, that was designed to transform the way that regulatory agencies function. Um, so we have, but after uh, the Obama administration left office, uh, there was a gentleman who uh, became the next president uh, I use that term loosely, and there was a complete, basically everything that was done uh, uh, under Perez and Weil was reversed. 
um, and, and to the point that the uh, that the, mem the memorandums that uh, uh, that David had issued were actually taken off the website and no longer uh, able to find. You, no one could find them, but you just see. And so what was left was you had states, particularly blue states or purplish states, that were interested in enforcement, uh, who took up the gauntlet while the feds walked away, and you had a dramatic divergence of an approach between the feds and the states. And this was, couldn't have been shown more uh, clearly than last April, uh, 2009, a year ago, uh, April, 2019, in which when uh, the NLRB general counsel determined that Uber drivers were independent contractors, the DOL issued an opinion letter concluding the workforce of an unidentified firm uh, should be considered independent contractors. Whereas in M Montana, Wisconsin and Michigan, you had uh, the, the governor's attorney generals establishing new uh, uh, task forces to go after the issue of payroll fraud. And on May 1st, uh, Rob Becerro Angelo, Commissioner of uh, Department of Labor in New Jersey, uh, basically said that DOL opinion and letter had zero effect in how New Jersey was going to enforce the state laws. So to conclude, what do we have today? We have a very divided industry. We have on the union on the one side where people are all treated as employees and non-union on the other side where an increasing number of people are treated, are paid in cash or treated as in independent contractors. In urban areas, it tends to be the stronger union presence and people, there's more uh, adherence to employment laws in suburban rural, it's um, uh, much less so. Similarly, commercial uh, in, in the institutional work versus residential, this is a much bigger problem in the residential market. And in blue states versus red states, it's a bigger problem in the red states where there is less appetite for enforcement. And it's also a problem in basic versus mechanical trades within the industry because mechanical trades tend to be more licensed and therefore more likely to be treated as employees. Um, Dale will talk about a, a report, I won't steal his thunder, that talks about the, the most uh, recent <clears throat> accounting of what the impact of this is. Um, so where are we today as we speak uh, it, uh, at this conference? Under Trump, the enforcement was limited to, to the state level. Uh, Biden had very strong language in his platform. He uh, supported AB5. He was opposed to Prop 22. Uh, he's, uh, the, the language was clear about misclassification. So presumably, and one of our panelists may be able to enlighten us on this, uh, uh, there, there should be, um, depending on who the Secretary of Labor is, uh, there should be uh, an increased uh, desire to enforce these laws and transform the industry. But the consequence is that the industry has been, uh, in many ways, standards in the industry have been decimated. And uh, in certain parts of the country, this is uh, the rule, not the exception. And it has been part of an overall dramatic decline in union density and a reduction of standards in the construction industry. And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Mark. Uh, our next presenter is Dale Bellman. Dale, if you will, I'll un unmute you here. I'm just unmuting. There you go. Welcome aboard. Yes, and I will share my desktop as a way of, uh, let's see, and where is that? Box. Oh, let's see. Okay. So you should now, uh, well. Yeah, we're having a distortion in your audio. You all, how's this? Better, worse? No, there's a fluttering sound every time you speak. There is. Hmm. Yeah, my only problem is to get rid of that, I have to log off and log back on. Go right ahead. Okay. We can, we can handle it. Okay, so, and let me just uh, make this full screen. Oh, I probably want to go to the top of it, but aside from that, uh, let's just keep moving. Oh, yes, very good. Okay, and we can go to full screen now. Okay, so we're going to be talking about measuring payroll fraud, which Mark has talked very eloquently about what's going on in the industry. And this was work that uh, I did with Russ Ormiston and Mark Ehrlich for the United Brotherhood of Carpenters to try to get a handle on 
how many people are involved, how much revenue is this costing individuals and states. So, you know, what's our research question? How prevalent it is? What are the social costs of payroll fraud? And payroll fraud, in my mind, is a case in which uh, employees or the state is being deprived of either negotiated or promised payments or are being deprived of certain legal protections in terms of payments, in terms of social insurance, which as employees they should get. Now, for the most part, as an economist, we can answer questions directly from BLS or census or BEA data. So for example, with workers, we have large nationally representative samples, current population survey, American Community Survey, and the SIP, uh, all ways of getting at households and workers. There are also employer surveys coming out of the unemployment insurance system and the quarterly census of employment and work or employer survey, surveys, the OES. So we have those as basic surveys, which we learn about the world labor markets from, standard stuff, Lots of good research. It's getting more exciting as we're able to link these surveys, but uh, more on that. But we have a problem. Illegal payments are hidden from regulators and data collectors. And further, and I don't know if this goes on in other sectors, a pretty elaborate institutional structure that allows to hide these payments is, has come into existence. So for example, we've got a picture here of a check cashing store. And these are frequently used as an intermediary between, let's say, a large uh, contractor who may have may be working for, let's say, Toll Brothers or Pulte or whatever. They get a check, and then they're going to uh, issue these checks to a first-level subcontractor. Uh, that first-level subcontractor will go or maybe a second level will go into a check cashing store, get the check cashed for cash, and then start distributing it to lower level subcontractors. So what that does is it creates a break in any paper trail from the owner, Pulte, Toll Brothers, whatever, uh, the initial subcontractor, and then lower level subcontractors. So that makes a big difference. There are lots of other things. There are groups of facilitators who basically set up and this is true in Florida, set up a number of shell front firms that buy work, cheap worker comp packages that go with uh, the shell firm. And then those can be rented by subcontractors who are required to post the fact they have workers' compensation. Now, those workers' compensation policies are usually set up for work or a number of workers a type of work that isn't consistent with what's going on, but they're sufficient to post. So that's a sort of elaborate subcontracting structure and institutional structure you start getting. You have many layers of subcontractors. So our problem is this underground economy, and it's an institutionalized underground economy, is pretty big. So as I said, there are a couple methods of going at this, and Mark's already mentioned state-specific studies where uh, Researchers cooperate with unemployment insurance agencies and actually use the random audits done by these unemployment insurance agencies to get their hands around the extent of misclassification. Uh, that has a strength that it's really very accurate and is uh, representative of the industry. It has a problem in that, first of all, you have to get this support of the unemployment insurance agency, and two, I'm not convinced that the unemployment insurance agencies, which do very well with misclassification, do well with uh, only payments. Uh, the Michigan agency said they do okay with that, but there are a lot of problems because it's cash. The whole point is to hide it, and so it, would it takes a lot of work to dig those out. So again, we're stuck with indirect methods. We look for gaps in available data. And as you'll see, we have some issues with accuracy, and we're going to have some a wide range of outcomes. But 
This is something that we can work with government agencies on, especially with the trade change administration. I think that's going to be easier into the future. So how many workers were misclassified or are working off the books in the construction industry? So how prevalent is payroll fraud? On household surveys, we have about 10.5 million jobs in the construction industry as of August 2017. Okay, those are jobs, employees. However, if we go to the UI-based records, there are only 7.1 million jobs, so legal wage and salary jobs. So there's a somewhat over 3 million difference between these two, 3.36 million. And that suggests perhaps the scope of some idea of the size of payroll fraud, but we'll take a closer look at that. So what's the composition? There are, in construction, of course, many legitimate self-employed workers. The uh, electrician who comes over, does the work, uh, is licensed and, uh, you know, pays their taxes and so on, is a legitimate self-employed worker. Likewise, there are many others, but there's some other groups in here. There are misclassified workers, and this would be a case where a worker for, let's say, a, a uh, drywall subcontractor is hired, but is uh, treated legally as if they are an independent contractor. They may or may not have tools of the trade. They may not meet the ABC test. They probably don't meet the ABC test for being a self-employed worker, but they're misclassified as a self-employed worker. Another one is simple off the books employment. What this is, is very common and that check cashing story you saw a picture of is a big part of this. So what's happening there is uh, a first or a second or a third level sub hires people onto a job and then uh, gets the check from whoever the person hiring them is, goes to a check cashing store, gets the check cashed. There's no record, uh, you know, because of the way check cashing stores are set up. Even though the check may be quite large, there's not going to be a bank record of it being cashed. Uh, and then distributes the cash to the people who are working for them. So that's off the books workers, and that's becoming steadily more common in construction. So how do we estimate the proportion that is working illegally, seeing that there are, as I said, three components, one of which is legal, two of which are not. We have a 2020 UBC report, the empirical methodology to estimate the incidence and costs of payroll fraud, and we'll be going through that. Uh, momentarily. And so what we're going to do is we're end up using both individual firm underreporting and income underreporting by self-employed construction workers, IRS data, to try to get at this. Our best guess is that between, let's say, 39% and 64% nationally uh, of illegal of workers in construction are ill or that they're self-employed are actually illegally employed. That's not the entire construction labor force, but those, those are the proportion of people who report that they're self-employed or think that they're an employee, but actually are self-employed. We'll take a look at that. So here's some data that we have on this, and this is out of the, our report. Uh, we have a couple different sources of data. One is what is total employment in construction? And so we have total employment in this case uh, out of a combination of uh, CPS and uh, CPS data or ACS. This is actually the ACS data. And of this, total employment is 10.5 million. Total self-employment is 3.4 million. And then what we can take a look at here is, okay, how many of uh, the, I take a look at how many sole proprietors are there in construction? So those are people who are working, they don't have partners, they don't have other groups, and you can 
can see, if we take a look and do a comparison, we end up with uh, about half a million uh, because of the gap between what we find in the way of total self-employed and the number of sole proprietors reported using the IRS data, it's about half a million. If we use the census uh, non-employer data, so these are individuals who report not having any employees, it's somewhat larger. It's about 873,000. So that's between 5.1 and 8.3% of total employment seems to be illegal self-employment, cases where people are essentially set, uh, CPS data suggests there are many more people who are employed that can be explained by legal employment or by legal self-employment. We use a second approach, which we favor, which is income underreporting. And what is income underreporting? Essentially what this is, again, what we've got here is uh, typically using IRS data, trying to take a look and figure out the degree to which people who say that they're self-employed are only reporting a part of their data or their income. And so what we do on the garage, looked at IRS and took a look at CPS forms and came up with an initial number of 23.3% of self-employment income in construction was not reported uh, to the IRS. So that gives us 23.3%. As a total of employment, that would give us 7.5%. Uh, if we take Alvin and bring in some review economics and statistics data, which finds that even on CPS and ACS data, people are still under reporting, self employed are still under reporting their income. Then, and just for that, then we end up with illegal self employment being 700, oh, sorry, being 1.3 million. So, what this is, it takes Almond Arad's initial figures and then rolls them up by 25% because of the RES data. I'm now going to jump to the thing I find most convincing which is the BEA methodology. And BEA finds that about 44% of self-employment income is not reported to the IRS. So that's 44%, in which case that's 14.1% of total employment in construction. And we have some other estimates. Uh, IRS recent 2016 says 64% of self-employment data is not reported. So you can see that this varies between if we use the adjusted Alman Arad data, about 1.3 million. If we use the IRS data, about 2.1 million uh, individuals who are uh, Ill illegally employed or not fully reporting the income they earn in construction. Okay, so we've got that there. Uh, that's a substantial number. As I said, that's you know anywhere from 12 to 20 percent of the construction labor force. Those are big numbers. Now, our next question is, what were the social costs of payroll fraud in the construction industry? And our, again, our problem is we don't have data on the earnings of workers employed illegally. Typically, you know, uh, typically when a someone from uh, BLS or census goes out and says, so how much did you earn from illegal employment? People say very little about that. Gail, are you almost done? Because we're running over time quite a bit. Okay, I'll get through this quickly. Okay, our solution to evaluate costs at different income assumptions if workers had been employed legally. Aaron Sojourner and I have done that. And we have the social costs are equal to cost per worker and times the number of workers. Uh, this table simply tells you how we did it. An important distinction here. The first data column is uh, what, it you know, what it costs a legal employer. The second one is Aaron and I made the assumption of arbitrage so that a person who was employed in construction but was illegally employed, misclassified or paid cash would receive the full value of their fringe benefits and their wage premium. So that, for example, would be pension and health care. So that would add another $4,000. And the third column 
the most realistic for people who are misclassified or cash only, they don't get the value of their benefits. And what you can see if you drop down to the bottom is a legal employer saves, or an illegal employer who pays a premium reduces their cost by 14.3%. An illegal employer who doesn't put in the wage premium, pension costs, healthcare costs, saves 30.1% of their net cost. So very quickly, and then I'll be finished, how much does this cost overall uh, all the different groups here? And what we can see here is we have three different assumptions. I'll take a look at the $35,000 a year. These are median or various cuts on the income distribution. Our idea here was, so what if uh, we have 30,000 a year, 35 or 40,000? So total labor costs, if they're hired legally for someone at $35,000 a year would be almost $60,000. If that worker was a hired fraudulently, but uh, you know, no premium, $44,500 if they're hired fraudulently, but they get that premium, they're earning almost $51,000. And then we break out the different pieces of this. So that's things like overtime pay not receive, workers' compensation funds shortfall, unemployment insurance shortfall, and the employer share of FICA offloaded onto workers. Those are pretty substantial in each case. There's also an effect on Social Security and Medicare, which varies from 1,500 to 5,000. There's a federal income tax shortfall and a state income tax uh, shortfall. And so we compute all of these. These are all in millions of dollars. And so, for example, the federal income tax shortfall would be from 480 million to 1.8 billion dollars. Those are substantial amounts of money. And to, if you take a look, employers shave between six and 17 billion in labor costs. Now this of course kills legal employers. You cannot, in many of these markets, you can't operate legally. So for example, there is no legal drywall employer in Western Michigan because drywall is done illegally with misclassified or cash only workers. Thank, thank you, Dale. Thank you. All right, um, uh, very, very uh, in, impressive and, and concerning uh, presentation. Um, our, our next presenter is uh, Rebecca Smith. Becky? I'm here, yeah, can everyone hear me? Yes, very well. Very good. <laughs> a couple of mishaps with internet at my office, so I am at home, and if a uh, small basset hound comes running <laughs> by, it's because he believes playing with him is more important than anything else. Um, I'm no going to try and- There are no small basset hounds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to share my screen if I can. And let's see if I can make this be a slideshow from the beginning. There we go, yay. I think everyone can see that. Um, so as uh, Bill said at the beginning, my work has been much more, well, focused broadly on misclassification, but in recent years, more narrowly on what we all know um, as the gig economy app-based work. And I, the argument that I'd like to make here is that it's becoming a new model for deregulation and a new approach in that um, we've heard from Mark and Dale and we all know about illegal misclassification, which has sometimes been stopped through public enforcement or private enforcement or um, policy, often through a pretty laborious pro process. Now the shift is, if you will, to state sanctioned misclassification. So I want to just talk to you about how this progression of carve outs from uh, being an employer vis-a-vis -vis workers has progressed and then talk a little bit about 
what I think we're facing um, this year and what we might do to uh, combat this new approach by industry or the continuation of an old approach, you might say. So I think um, everyone knows this piece as well, that the gig economy gets all the attention is, is thus far a small uh, portion of the many, many industries in which misclassification occurs. But in what we have seen from NELP, uh, it is really driving this effort towards um, misclassification or reclassification through policy changes. So I wanna talk a little bit about the carve outs that we've been tracking for the last several years in the state. This sort of began really before um, there was much going on in terms of organizing. And I think before unions and advocates really understood the um, transportation network company or ride hailing app based work, the, the companies led by Uber got uh, partial or complete carve outs from being treated as employers in about half of the states. And they actually got preemption of state uh, city power to regulate in about 41 states in that first phase, which started about 2013, 2014. Then there was a second phase um, and here's a couple of places where the TNC carve outs lost. Then there was a second phase and those were led by the company Handy and those were marketplace platform contractor carve outs. And so they took the TNC idea of getting an exemption for their industry from being treated as employers from those responsibilities and applied it across what they called marketplace contractors, which was really any app dispatched work where someone would have you know, some modicum of control over their hours um, and a couple of other minor <laughs> pieces of control over their work. And those passed in seven states and then uh, administratively, uh, there was a rule in Texas as well. And that was kind of the second phase. Here are a couple of places where that phase two carve out did not pass. And then we started seeing um, what was called a Uniform Worker Classification Act which had uh, been developed by ALEC. And it was introduced just in a couple of places and did not pass in 2018 and 2019. And I suspect that along with Prop 22 will be the model for what we will see in 2021. And then of course there was a uh, Proposition 22 in California that I think we probably all know about and I will only talk about very, very briefly. The other piece that happened at the same time, and this is this merging of uh, approaches and strategies, was the development of a new federal uh, coalition or a new coalition of employers that focused mainly on the federal level called the Coalition for Workforce Innovation. And you can see here some of the members. So it is, you know, the companies that we think of as the gig economy in air quotes, um, but also Amway and Kelly Services and the Retail Industry Leaders Association and others. And if, you, if you're not familiar with these folks, um, take a look at their website. Um, among their policies and mission is to ensure that uh, so-called independent work is available to all of us across all industries. And we sort of we saw that in the Trump Department of Labor rulemaking recently, the notice of proposed rulemaking under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which to put it, I think simply would have said that any employer that gave workers some flexibility over hours and some 
flexibility or control over how they used assets, which I never really understood except for when that asset is a car or um, major tools, could easily have turned any of us into independent contractors. The Coalition for Workforce Innovation kind of got its start in opposition to the Federal PRO Act, but they um, showed up in force as well with the notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, so I'll just touch on California for a moment. Um, I think folks know that initially in California, there was a Supreme Court decision called Dynamics, which applied the ABC test to determine across industries who is an employee under California law. And then the state uh, legislature passed AB5, which applied ABC broadly, but gave some um, exemptions for industries that perhaps were closer to the line, I guess I would say. And then of course there was Prop 22 that was um, paid for and written and passed by the companies. And so in answer to the question of what's the matter with California, it was that the company spent over $200 million to get Prop 22 passed. And what Prop 22 does is um, take away coverage for unemployment insurance, for overtime pay, for paid sick leave, for paid family leave, and then it gives some rights that workers would have under AB5 and the ABC test, but these are um, not equal to what workers would have gotten under AB5 as regular employees. So the minimum wage in our calculation could result in loss of up to about $500 per week per worker. There of course is no overtime pay. The worker's compensation is faulty. Um, the protections for health and safety are faulty as well. And I won't go into a lot of detail about it. What happened in California it really was the money um, that the companies spent. They were willing to do almost anything to uh, get their uh, proposition passed. It was also that they engaged in a misinformation campaign. They um, really pushed with voters, and there's some data that shows that voters were confused, that they were actually, they agreed <laughs> that workers needed basic rights and they in their wisdom were going to make sure that workers had those rights. Um, of course, the companies had been violating the law for years and years and years and the only reason workers didn't have rights is that the companies were um, simply ignoring state law. I want to talk a little bit about what we think we might see in 2021 and We've been watching this mainly, um, have been watching where the companies have established coalitions for independent work, um, their own PACs. And that has happened in Massachusetts, Illinois, uh, Washington state, and then we know just through um, our conversations with allies who also, and legislators, I guess, that um, there will be fights in these other states. And what we anticipate is that it will look like Prop 22, um, you know, some third way version of labor rights that is not the same as being an employee and perhaps coupled with some kind of portable benefit, which the companies have been talking about for quite some time. Um, here's just some of my thoughts about what what this moment means. Um, I really think this is an all hands on deck moment for all of us and that there is something to be learned from California and there is there are strategies that have been employed that can be useful um, across the country. And the first for me is centering workers and workers organizations. In a fair fight in California, 
the gig organizing and groups and unions um, did a phenomenal job of lifting up workers leadership, um, especially workers of color and stressing the impact of Prop 22 on workers of color, even as the companies were professing to um, be supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the second I think is communications and again, really centering workers in those communications. I really believe that uh, one of the reasons that the companies were not carved out of AB5 was that workers showed up to the legislators, legislators, legislature, and talked about living in their cars and talked about what was really happening to them, what their experience was working for the companies and could then overcome the stories that had been told by the companies, you know, since 2013, 2014, when they very easily got carve outs from state laws, that these jobs were terrific and that, you know, flexibility is the only thing that really matters. I think that research is really important. Um, many of you saw uh, Ken Jacobs' study in California that showed how much uh, Uber and Lyft were underpaying the state unemployment insurance system to the tune of $413 million over a few years. And an audit has happened also in New Jersey that, that assessed Uber, um, at least initially with 649 million in back payroll taxes. I think it could be really useful in this moment of COVID for that research to happen in other places. Um, also research, including surveys, and I'm sure you all have other ideas or maybe undertaking other research that could be helpful. Um, enforcement, uh, Prop 22 is in California. It's not in Massachusetts or New Jersey or other states that um, have been both paying uh, regular UI benefits to workers as employees and um, have been bringing enforcement actions. And I think we need more of that. And then of course, oops, more policy development that I think we're going to hear a little bit from David about as well. And alliances between union folks and worker centers and academics and <laughs> advocates such as myself and especially civil rights organizations and women's rights organizations. I think that's what it's going to take to push this back. Um, so any questions that you might have, this is how you can find me. Um, NELP also is operating a password protected listserv and website for allies to share their campaign information and materials and strategies. And I can send invites to everyone to join that uh, password protected listserv as well. So we have our work cut out for us in 2021 and um, I know we can do this. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was wonderful and on time. <laughs> <laughs> David Weil, uh, please uh, step up to the podium. All right, thanks, Bill. Let me share. Oh. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I am, I guess, the cleanup batter um, with my co panelists before we get to our discussion. So, and in fact, um, I'm happy to play that role because a lot of what I want to do ties together scenes we've heard from the other three presenters. Um, I want to bring this back from the broader. Um, canvas that Becky was talking about in terms of the larger issue of, of gig work broadly construed and back to the construction industry. But I do actually want to, in a, in a couple of moments, back, get back to the big picture and then apply it back to construction. Um, my original um, assignment was to give a talk about uh, reestablishing or new approaches to regulating misclassification and under the table 
uh, payments in construction. Um, the more I thought about it, the more I think that's um, too narrow a uh, description about, I think, the task at hand. And instead, I'd like to talk about reestablishing workplace rights and social benefits in construction, because the aim is not to attack misclassification or under the table payments. The real question is how do we reestablish basic sets of rights and benefits um, to workers in the construction industry? Um, and I wanna talk about that framing. The, so the objective function being restoring those rights and benefits. Um, and I wanna talk about it in the context of the erosion that Mark beautifully laid out in his talk and he has an ILRR paper that, that does the same in greater detail. Um, I wanna link the two um, and very briefly, because Mark did a masterful job of it, talk about how the erosion of rights and social benefits occurred and what is required to reestablish them in a world where we can't go back to the good old days, that's not how the world works, but instead need to think proactively of new ways to reestablish that. Um, so what, what um, we can take this whole discussion back to the fact that once upon a time, we did have an organization of many parts of the construction industry that did provide for rights and benefits. And it was premised on this model where you had a couple of important elements. You had a substantial part of the workforce in many major construction markets organized by unions, uh, which I'm showing at the bottom. This is a union, predominantly union workforce. You had those workers operating through a control of labor supply through things like hiring halls, and you had the structure of an apprenticeship system where a lot of the development of skills was ha happening through joint labor management processes that was again controlling the labor supply and creating stability for rights and benefits through that system. You had at the top of this um, picture, again, Mark described this, you had unionized general contractors that stipulated in their collective bargaining agreements that all people on the construction site would also be union. So that was another source of um, substantial, uh, really creating an environment for workplace rights and, and, and benefits and, and good uh, pay. Um, and then finally, you had uh, a prevailing wage system in public sector construction that also reinforced these kinds of systems. So people would be employed in this system and you would have the kind of end result um, implied by um, the discussion of what we've lost through Dale's estimates of the, the scale of uh, the cost of misclassification and underpayment. We saw over time, so that's where you get this overarching set of protections and benefits. And the question again, I'd like to put on the table is what set of I'm gonna focus on public policies might allow us to start to rebuild that set of protections and benefits. The erosion happened because of, uh, again, I'm not gonna restate what Mark talked about, but we saw certainly at an early stage, uh, uh, the erosion of union market share, the loss of union um, control in many labor markets on one hand, and therefore um, a lot of what the stability created by hiring calls and apprenticeship systems was undermined for a larger percent of the workforce. Uh, you had construction management by whatever name replacing the general signatory contractor for the basic trades, the carpenters and the operating engineers and laborers of the world. And instead everything broken into a series of subcontracts. And that was a very important stage of the erosion of workplace conditions and benefits. Um, as this part of the sector grew in lots of parts of the, of the country. But you'll notice we had for many parts still, most people in this bottom part of my figure were still employees. And that's where this more recent stage um, that has had the erosion of market share um, compounded by the fact you have the emergence of sub subcontractors, middle players, the different kinds of institutions that Dale described emerging on the scene that allowed one to break apart even the notion of employment uh, and the growth of this larger sector of independent contractors 
and how that in turn undermines the set of rights and benefits that bring us together. So we need to think about reestablishing a system that has been pulled apart both at the top and the bottom. And that is no small feat, but one has to, in my view, view the overall policy instruments that you have either through existing law, or I'll also talk about new policies that might be created on a federal basis uh, to create a new system to reestablish um, a stability that allows ultimately for the workforce to both share in the gains of the value created through construction, whether in public or private markets, um, and allow workers to exercise their rights across the whole array of laws that we have for working people as well as get the kinds of social benefits like worker compensation and unemployment insurance that concern it. So that's the, that's the operative question, but I put it in this context of what the erosion has been in terms of then thinking about what are the policy tools to rewrite it. Um, I'm gonna talk about three primary methods, put them on the table for discussion without in this talk going into um, any great detail as there is particularly the policy proposal I have is laid out in great detail in a paper that uh, Tanya Goldman and I have written that's gonna be published uh, next month um, that lays out a policy proposal. But I also wanna talk about um, the world we live in because uh, getting any federal policy passed is not going to be an easy thing no matter what happens in Georgia. And, um, and working people are facing every day huge declines in their income and, and are facing greater and greater risks that I think need to be addressed immediately. And so that's what I wanna talk about enforcement in the private sector and through public contracting um, in order to deal ultimately with the, the structural changes that we've been talking about this afternoon. So first I wanna talk about private sector enforcement. Um, and um, Mark alluded to some of the work that we did in the Obama administration that I think a lot of progressive states have been doing uh, in the last four years as the federal government has basically stepped out of the business of enforcing our basic labor policies. Um, and the notion behind a lot of those efforts has to do with refocusing enforcement. What I have in this picture is the same overlay of where we are now uh, in terms of the structure of construction um, and the typical response we've had with enforcement powers. And that is where we have focused enforcement of misclassification directly on the entities that are um, at least the directly responsible parties for that. So that might be the fly-by-night sub-subcontractors that exist and act as conduits for misclassification uh, which is something we have all seen in all kinds of places, uh, or the other institutions like pay loan lenders and other financial institutions, they'll describe that play this intermediate role, or with the subcontractors operating uh, at a lower level of construction structures um, that are the direct parties that are the misclassifiers in order to recover um, uh, back wages and rights for uh, the workforce. Um, now, my basic notion would be if we think again about the structures that have been destabilized, those kinds of efforts are always going to be very much uh, limited to the number of people or to the institutions you're directly focusing on. They don't change the systemic causes of the decline in rights and social benefits. And they are therefore always a very imperfect solution, particularly in a world where you will never have enough investigators or inspectors at the federal or state level to do the work. And instead, the, the basic notion of focusing at the top that we uh, employed at the Department of Labor, uh, and again, as I say, that there are a lot of states that have done really important work in this area, including now in uh, California, Washington State, my home state, of Massachusetts, um, and that is focusing upward. It's basically saying trying to create greater liability for these actions, not just of the great, the direct participants, but the, the level above that. 
And the notion is by putting greater regulatory enforcement pressure up here, one can change the conditions on which the lower levels are allowed to persist. Um, and in a world of limited resources, um, the argument would be that's a better way to use those inspection activities in order to create upward pressure. What does it mean in actuality? Well, it means that things like we sign 38 memorandums of understanding with states to allow us to both share information and in many states conduct reinforcing investigative activities or integrated activities on enforcement to put pressure not at this level, but way up here. Uh, secondly, we entered into agreements with institutions like the Internal Revenue Service that has its own sticks and authorities to affect behavior again that emanates downward rather than trying to fix it um, from below. We changed inspection protocols in terms of how we linked construction investigations. Uh, we had a major um, successful drive in a company called um, Paul Johnson Drywall that was one of the early players in this kind of game of setting independent contracting up as each worker being declared an LLC between Friday afternoon and Monday um, with a little magic dust changing people's legal status. Again, what the attempt was, and this was through both the actions of the Wage and Hour Division and the Solicitor of Labor to actually take on the larger player that was doing this across Arizona um, uh, in Utah at the time. Um, it's a much more uh, coordinated and litigation focused activity that then is followed up by comprehensive compliance agreements that change the terms of the game going after. So these are the kinds of things on the private sector that one needs to think about under existing laws that one would have to ramp back up at the federal level and take advantage of the fact that states in 2020 are in a very different place that they were in 2014, that there are a lot more states who have also understood this and changed their game. Um, equally, and there's been a lot of discussion about this in the last few years is the important role that public sector enforcement happens through the contracting system, through the letting of public contracts uh, is a very powerful tool that could be used more effectively. Again, the, the idea is instead of doing what many agencies, including wage and hour division historically did, which is lower level prevailing wage enforcement focused on the direct purveyors of misclassification, moving that game upward which means among other things, a lot of the things I've already described, but also doing things like um, using debarment authority, uh, something we started to use, I think could be used much more extensively in the future um, by the federal government, particularly if there's a great deal of federal building and infrastructure development, but it also requires getting government agencies at the table, which is something that I think is often overlooked agencies also have an incentive to underpay, to bring in bids that are lower because it's their cost. And so you have to have coordinated responses on the public side that include the government agencies letting contracts and bidding work in different ways. Uh, and and, and you know, we can talk more about what some of those elements are. So that's under existing system. But if you look at my pictures, um, I would argue that those measures don't create the comprehensive kinds of set of forces that existed historically in the world I started with. And that's where I think we need to think about uh, if we're going to get in the realm of new policies, we need to think about new approaches for public policy. And the approach that's outlined in the, the paper I have with Tanya Goldman really talks about a different model entirely of thinking about our whole set of federal workplace rights and thinking about what we call concentric circles, starting with core rights and protections that as a public policy measure, we want to ensure for all workers, that all workers have, regardless of whether they're an independent contractor or an employee. Things like the right to a safe and healthy workplace. Things like the basic notion, you should be paid if you work, which is a notion that is uh, unfortunately violated every day 
uh, across the economy, not just construction, but across the economy. And the notion of a basic minimum wage related to work, again, not employment. Um, discrimination and protection against sexual harassment and protection against retaliation for the use of rights, I would put in this category. Um, there's a second ring that is about employment-based rights. Um, those rights we want to still protect with employment and having a strong structure of default assumptions about employment rights, uh, having to prove that you are actually a legitimate independent contractor rather than the reverse. This is what we see in AB5. And then finally, an outer ring that detaches what to me is a nonsense argument that we somehow have to choose benefits and flexibility against uh, employment protections, really thinking about accessible, portable benefits uh, and social um, insurance, um, regardless, or again, accessible through different methods of employment, um, as we have had in the construction, union construction sector for decades. Final slide, Bill, and I'm done. Um, let me bring that back to this picture. And basically what the argument is, is that you need to have the inner circle of rights tied to workers um, at, the, at the foundational level, regardless of status, employee or, or, or uh, um, contractor. Secondarily, the middle circle with a much stronger notion of rights tied to employment with a stronger and clearer definition of who is an employee. And then finally, this penumbra of benefits available to all workers again, maybe through different mechanisms, but assured through different systems to do that. And in so doing, you create a more comprehensive set of overarching set of protections and benefits, different but analogous to what we once had in the construction industry. David, that was so much, so quick. That was great. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to be turning to our two discussants. Uh, Catherine Abraham and Matt Capice. Uh, bef before they begin, I'm going to uh, remind those who have joined us uh, 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 that uh, you can use the Q&A function on the bottom menu uh, in order to present any questions you may have to the set of panelists. That said, um, um, I would like to turn the uh, podium over to Catherine Abraham. Thank you very much. I, I'm really happy to be a part of this um, quite interesting session. So let, let me, I, I want to comment on just three things. Um, the first thing I want to emphasize is th the fact that there are a lot of losers from misclassification and off the books employment. It's not just the workers who are misclassified or paid off the books. It's also the, the people who are competing with them, the firms who are competing with the firms that are, are doing this. Um, it's federal, state, and local governments who, who lose income tax revenue, payroll tax revenue. Um, you know, I, I think an economist's starting point for looking at the labor market is to think in terms of competition and in a competitive labor market, if people are being paid as independent contractors and that comes along with not having benefits and having more fluctuation in income and so on, that they, they should get paid more in terms of their base pay. But I, I would agree that that's not a good description, especially at the low end of the labor market of what actually happens. So that's the, the, the starting point. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in trying to estimate the extent of misclassification and off the books employment. And for the reasons that, that Dale gave, it's, it's hard to come up with these estimates. I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, the approach to trying to quantify misclassification and off the books employment that Dale described. Um, I've taken these numbers from the paper that he referenced, so they may be slightly different than the ones in his slide, but the basic point is the same. In essence, what they're doing in the, the Bellman, Ormiston, and Ehrlich paper is to estimate the extent of misclassification as the difference between the number of people who, the number of jobs reported in the CPS that are wage and salary jobs 
minus the number of wage and salary jobs in the quarterly census of employment and wages. And then to estimate off the books employment, the authors are looking at the difference between total employment in the CPS and then the sum of wage and salary employment and self-employment from administrative sources. There's a variety of different ways that you can do this, but that's the basic strategy. And I have to say the results are very suggestive of uh, significant misclassification or off the books employment, though it's a little hard to be sure about the precise numbers. And I suspect it's going to be hard to track with any precision how this is trending over time. Um, though I, I would say that on balance, I suspect that if anything, the scale of the combined problem is, is greater than, than what's been estimated here. So let me, my, just my comments in terms of this empirical strategy. One comment is that there is some ambiguity as to whether the difference between wage and salary employment in the CPS and, and payroll employment in uh, the, the QCEW is really misclassification. It is true that there are more employee jobs in aggregate in the CPS than in the QCEW. And there's other, other research, not focused on construction, but more broadly, that provides direct evidence that there are, you know, on an individual basis, a lot of people who are coded as employees in the household survey data who it turns out are paid as independent contractors. Uh, you can learn about that by probing when people indicate that they work for an employer as to whether they really are an employee or they're an independent contractor. Uh, when you do that, there's a substantial fraction, again, across the economy as a whole who say, oh, I was an independent contractor. Uh, you can get at this by comparing the survey responses to tax data. And again, you find that there's quite a lot of people who say in the CPS annual social and economic supplement that they're wage workers, but when you look at their taxes, they only have self-employment income. Um, what's not clear is whether under current law, these workers legally should be categorized as employees. And that's just something that's hard to wrestle with. A second comment about these numbers is that the CPS employment numbers may be too low. Again, there's quite a lot of evidence uh, from other studies in the, for the economy as a whole that people don't report all of their informal employment on the CPS. And we know that because if you probe after people have been asked the CPS employment questions uh, for whether there was anything else they'd done to earn money, they tell you, yes, there was. Uh, we know about that because when you compare individuals in the CPS to what they told you on their, on their tax data, you find people who weren't reporting employment. The implication of that, if CPS employment is too low and you're identifying misclassification and off the books employment by looking at CPS numbers versus you know, administrative numbers, if you're missing people in the CPS, you're going to be understating misclassification and or off the books employment. And then finally, there's a, an issue about the reference periods used in these data. The CPS employment numbers that are taken as the total are averages of the numbers of people working across the 12 months of the year. So it's an average of the number of people working at a point in time across the 12 months. Whereas the, the administrative data, uh, the non-employer data are counts of people who worked at all in self-employment across the whole year. So you've got a bit of an apples to oranges comparison and the, the number of people working at any point during the year is gonna be bigger than the average of the number working at a specific month. What the net effect of that is gonna be is to underestimate the prevalence of off the books employment. So that's the reason I think that if anything, their numbers probably understate the extent of the problem. Um, I think it's worth pushing on this. I also think it would be worth pushing on uh, employer audits as a source of information. And that's maybe something we can talk a bit more about later. There's multiple agencies that conduct compliance audits that could identify misclassification. I know David worked a lot on trying to coordinate some of those efforts. Those audits are a mix of random audits and targeted audits. What I'd like to make an argument for is the proposition that having some fraction of audits in a coordinated fashion 
done randomly rather than in a targeted fashion could be very valuable. Um, it would help to develop targeting criteria for future audits, and it would provide a better means to monitor trends in misclassification and, and perhaps off the books employment. The other thing I wanted to comment briefly on is the, the paper that David mentioned uh, in his remarks that he's written with, with Tanya Goldman, um, which is a, a proposal for what policy with respect to misclassification worker rights more generally should be. Uh, he outlined the, the proposal very in, at a high level. Uh, there would be an inner circle of protections and rights that all workers would have. There would be a, a middle circle of rights that uh, employees would have together with a presumption of people being an employee unless they could show that they really were an independent contractor. And then an outer circle of broadened social insurance protections that would would apply to really everyone, but especially independent contractors. This is a really appealing approach, but I do have some questions about uh, the details and about implementation. So let me, I just have three comments. First off, there are obviously various ways, uh, approaches that you could take to determining employee status. And I, I, you know, I think it would be very helpful to have a clear and uniform standard for determining whether somebody is an employee or not. The test that's proposed in the Goldman and Weil paper would center on evaluating the workers' opportunities for profit or loss beyond just accepting or rejecting more work. This may be an unpopular position in this, this group, but I have to say that I am sympathetic to the idea that if a worker really is free to decide whether and when she's going to work, that she's not an employee. Um, for, for many people, you know, hours flexibility is in fact an important attraction. Uh, it's, very, it's unclear to me how if a worker sets their own hours, you know, unemployment insurance protections could, could be applied, overtime protections could be applied. Um, the, the, the counter argument or you know, a pushback might be that the companies for which these workers are performing tasks often set a lot of standards about how they, they have to do the work. You know, in some sense, that's can analogous to licensing requirements. It, it's in part trying to protect the consumers of their services. So I don't know that I, I don't know that this is the right answer, but I'm at least sympathetic to this idea that that that's an important part of determining whether someone is or is not an employee. The second comment that I would make is that this population is very heterogeneous. The concerns about independent contractors seem to relate primarily to individuals who make a living from their work as independent contractors, but there's a lot of people who are doing that sort of work who have another job or are basically retired but doing this on the side. If you, if you look at older adults, for example, the, the rate of uh, independent contractor type employment is, is very high. So my question really is, should the rules that govern independent contractor work in, in some fashion treat career independent contractors differently from casual independent contractors? And if so, how would you do that? My concern, I guess, is that if you impose uniform requirements that are appropriate for the career independent contractors, that that's just going to drive everybody else even further underground. And then finally, last comment, David has touched on this already, regulation can only go so far. Even with additional resources, enforcement's going to be a challenge. Uh, any kind of uniform rules that you could agree on would set a pretty low bar. For example, the federal minimum wage isn't much of a standard. So I think consistent with the, the spirit of what David was talking about, I think we also need to be discussing broader changes uh, that can improve life for American workers. You know, changes to laws to make it easier for unions to organize, national health insurance. A, a big part of the issue for independent contractors is that they don't have health insurance. I think it's crazy that we tie health insurance, which in my view should be a fundamental right to whether you're employed or not, and then finally, uh, a stronger means-tested safety net. So 
hopefully we'll have a bit of chance to discuss some of this, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to discuss these interesting papers. Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderful. And our, um, our second uh, uh, commenter is Matthew Capice. Matt, are you unmuted? Yes. Uh, I am unmuted. Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, uh, well, uh, we probably want to get the questions, uh, so I'll keep my, uh, my comments uh, brief. Uh, let me first try to share my screen. All right, you all should see that, right? Uh, do you see my screen with nope. the slide? Nope, not yet. All right. Not um, yet, Matt. Hmm. All right, well, it seems like I lost almost all of you. Why don't I just proceed without showing well, without showing the slide in order to save some time. Uh, I, I, in, I have reviewed and read uh, all of the state studies, uh, and of course the one done by uh, uh, Dale, Russ, and Mark on the, the, the national uh, numbers on uh, fraud in the construction industry, and and as as. Uh, Dale has presented it, and uh, as we heard, uh, there's faults in the data, and there's some more industry-specific data uh, should be made uh, available. Um, now, there, there's already a, a report in the system that could help that. Uh, the state unemployment divisions report to the federal government on the ETA 581 report form uh, the amount of misclassification they find in their in their field audits in their auditing. Uh, so one of the recommendations that the United Brotherhood of Carpenters made uh, to the Biden Labor Transition Team was to uh, change or add a requirement to that ETA 581 report and collect industry specific data on the employers. Uh, the industries of the employers and the industries where the employees worked uh, that they were misclassified. Uh, right now, they just give bulk numbers. So why not make it industry specific? Uh, what we can also do to dive into the um, misclass 1099 misclassification versus uh, the off the books payments is uh, to have uh, an additional line in that uh, ETA 581 report uh, where they would need to tell us, uh, they would need to tell the government uh, whether uh, the, the, uh, their findings were of 1099 misclassification and how much of it was or not, was there no reporting uh, at all. Uh, so there's an opportunity there for the Biden administration to give us more data points to adequately track industry specific data on misclassification off the of books employment. Also, we have coming up in 2022, the, the US economic uh, census. Um, and maybe we should take a look at the US economic census data, questions that are being asked of employers and see what additional data points uh, we can collect from that census uh, for um, uh, for our studies and misclassification off the books employment in general and in the construction industry in, in particular. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about um, enforcement and this wraps up, uh, uh, ties together a, a lot of the comments. Um, I, I come to the discussion today as, as a person that uses the data that, that David, uh, Bill, uh, Dale, um, and, put together and, and try to create policy out of that uh, to help workers and law-abiding uh, law employers. Uh, last week, there was a, an article in the Charleston Gazette Mail, it's Charleston, West Virginia, uh, where it talked about how the state was losing 820,000 to $1.1 million a year because of, of misclassification in the state. And they revealed in that, in that article that there's only one, one, one 
full-time unemployment insurance auditor for the entire state. And that person has a starting salary of $27,729 a year. That, that's about $13.33 uh, an hour. Um, so enforcement's being crippled by lack of resources and, and, and frequently, as you can see in, the, in this wage structure in West Virginia, uh, uh, enforcement by the states and, and probably the federal government too, I'm not as, as familiar with the wage levels there, is treated like a redheaded uh, stepchild in the enforcement community. So there's, so I think um, it would be helpful if there were studies of real effective enforcement not just what people are doing policy-wise, but how it's being implemented. And what is really real effective enforcement in this issue, on this issue? And um, uh, that will have to dive into things like uh, these salary levels and how people are, are paid who do, who do the work uh, on, in, in greater depth on the resources being provided to import, people doing the enforcement. Then let's look at state, states like Florida and others. Um, now, Florida has effective, well, uh, Florida has done something like what David is talking about. Workers, uh, construction workers have to be covered by workers' compensation, but of course there's some exceptions. Compared to other states, they have well-staffed enforcement. They have, they have good criminal, and good civil law, but nevertheless, uh, the and they also have dedicated workers' comp fraud uh, prosecutors. But never, nevertheless, the construction industry there at all levels is dominated by people that are being paid uh, off the books. Uh, we've the, the growth that we saw in Florida of labor brokers uh, using off the books workers uh, has not abated. And in fact, is is uh, spread and has become just about nation nationwide. So, I have yet to see a paper written or a study written on what is effective enforcement and what it looks like. And research like that uh, would help people like me go into rooms with policymakers and do the types of things that David is talking about that need to be done. So there's some more room there for, uh, for uh, uh, some research. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna stop and we don't have much time, maybe some time for questions, right, Bill? Um, hang on. Yes, we have time uh, for questions. Um, I, I would, uh, we're, we're at, uh, uh, 528 now. So we have 17 minutes remaining in this session. Um, I would first ask the panelists if uh, any of you have uh, comments, observations, or questions for your fellow panelists or responses to the uh, discussants. If so, unmute yourself or raise your hand if you need me to unmute you. No. Well, I'm I'm happy. Let me make a comment in response to um, uh, Catherine's great uh, discussion points. David. Um, and I guess uh, just on all three points, and I I, um, I would respectfully disagree with um, Catherine's first point about um, the ability to um, decide whether or not to work as being definitive of of employment status. Um, and the case I would suggest to you is construction. I mean, construction is an industry where people decide um, whether or not they're going to work. And um, what has evolved in that system is employers obviously are aware of the issue that, uh, that Catherine rightly points out. If you have complete discretion over that as the employee, um, that can lead to dis you know the, the wrong set of incentive structures and employers respond to that by having 
obviously criteria about once you're on site, what the expectations are, the, the length of the gig and so on. Um, and I would point out going to the, the whole area that, that uh, Rebecca Smith was talking about, you know, companies like Uber also get this. And this is why there are such tight bounds built into those systems that once you log in, there are certain things you can and can't do. Um, so I think that that as, the, as a central indicia of whether or not your employment um, doesn't work because of number one, there are so many other aspects of what makes someone that true independent contractor. That's why we look at this idea of real control over profit and loss that includes something as an economist I embrace and that is, hey, do you get to set your own price? That seems to me pretty fundamental as a much more useful indicia. I, I'm not saying that the issues that you're raising, Catherine, aren't present, I'm, but I'm saying that in the push and pull of labor market relationships that evolve, um, employers have ways to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I would jump to the, the third point Catherine made that I totally agree with, and that is um, we can't do what we really are seeking, I think, in this discussion of reestablishing workplace relations solely focused on what the government does, that there have to be other social institutions that also move into here. What concerns me about where we are right now is we have had such an erosion of workplace protections that a lot of the other institutions that used to provide supportive norms that kept wages up, that created wage norms and behavior norms that tended to protect workers who also tend to be the less leverage, the, the people with the least leverage in labor market relationships um, that tended to protect them. Those have been so eroded over decades that I think we have to think about strong public policies that can then lead to other institutions, again, taking some of the important reinforcing roles that I agree with Catherine um, have to be part of ultimately uh, the, the full picture. Okay. Thank you. Any any other responses? I'm checking the uh, Q and A, and we have not had uh, people uh, submit uh, questions for the panel. Uh, so I am. Uh, so this gives us more time uh, to finish up some comments or uh, have a conversation uh, amongst the people on the panel. Maybe I could ask David a question on a different topic, which is. The, this the the role of audits in trying to monitor and assess what's what's going on in this space. Um, yeah, my, my my sense is that the audit the auditing is understaffed. They tend where they can to focus on complaints that come in. But do you have a reaction to my suggestion that some portion of these audits be set aside to be done randomly? as a, a former practitioner in this space. Right, no, no, I, I, I like that idea. Uh, and in fact, Wage and Hour did it for a period of time. Um, in fact, the first place I learned about and studied enforcement, and I, I, you know, I, there are some very good deep studies of enforcement to, to Matt's point um, that have been done. I mean, Janice Fine's done some great qualitative study. Dan Galvin at Northwestern's done some really good data heavy uh, assessments of enforcement. Um, but I, I would say uh, the first place I got to evaluate wage and hour division was the use of random monitor based investigations by the wage and hour division in the late part of the Clinton administration to evaluate the effectiveness of their garment industry efforts. Um, and using that data that gives you, you, you can't, you know, as, as your question implies, you can't use administrative data if you're trying to focus on where the problems are to then assess what to take the temperature of things. Um, it was an incredibly uh, helpful and informative tool about which interventions Wage and Hour did that actually had bite, that had impact on deterrence and future compliance versus the ones that were actually having no impact. So it turns out things like this training people about, training employers about what the Fair Labor Standards Act had no impact on future compliance behavior. Having an employer have a 
independent third party monitor that had the ability to do random investigations had substantial impact on future compliance behavior. So um, I think you're right. It, it's a very effective tool. The problem is resource constraints. Um, the problem is if, if you are using the same investigators that you need so desperately to attack the basic problems an agency is facing, also to do these random investigations, um, it's a real trade-off. And it's just not an easy choice. It, it's, a, it's basically a direct one because you can't get third, it's hard to, to do, at least in the wage and hour space, and this is true for OSHA as well, to do the kind of work that you need for an independent investigation. You need an investigator who both has the authority to go in and do things like do payroll, mm -hmm. look at payroll and do private um, unsupervised um, uh, uh, questions, uh, discussions with workers that only an investigator has. So that, that's the tension in it, but the idea I think is, is very important. I mean, that, that tension comes up you know, all the time in thinking about you know, evaluating on an ongoing basis how effective what the government is doing really is. You know, so my, my, my view in general is that you know, the, the, the people in, in, who are running programs or handling enforcement tend to want to seeing all of the need to devote all of the resources to attacking known problems. But to me, it makes a lot of sense to set aside some small portion of your resources to the evaluation function. And, and this would, would fit into that category. No, I agree, I agree. Um, so I, I would have one comment and, and a question. Um, you know, the, David made a, an important point, which is that there was a system in place in the construction industry that it worked in terms of all of these protections. And it was because it was a 80% union market share industry. And in that sense, uh, actually unions were relatively hostile to government regulation and intervention other than making sure that the prevailing wage rates were established correctly uh, because they didn't need it. And what, what I think we sometimes forget that the reason we now talk so much about the need for regulations and defining independent contractors versus employees and all of the various other kind of, you know, twisting ourselves into a pretzel about what kind of regulations is because the underlying system is broken. And that underlying system was not government regulation. It was a strong union presence. And so that I think that it's important that public policy not only advocate for strong uh, enforcement and laws to protect workers without unions, but to also support the, the ability to organize in order to create unions so that the enforcement doesn't have to be done by federal and state governments to the extent that it is. In some ways, the reason it's so important is because of the absence of unions. And, and I think uh, that that often gets lost in the uh, discussion and I, that that needs to be part of the public policy recommendations as, as well as what the government should and shouldn't do. Um, that's my comment. My question was for Becky. Um, this listserv that you're talking about, can you, can you uh, tell us a little bit about it? Sounds very interesting. Yeah, we just started um, running this listserv. When was it? Um, I think around when COVID hit. Um, and we just use it for folks who are doing research or involved in campaigns or wanna talk about strategy or policy solutions to talk to each other. And, and so far, mainly we've been doing a, a weekly news roundup for folks in this area, um, but we hope to develop it into much more of a community and happy to invite folks to it. We'd love to join. Uh, um, the Q&A coming in, um, we have a question from uh, Jeanette Aranda. Um, regulations requiring the general contractor liability would help some uh, in compliance. Debarment and removal of licenses needs to be enforced. There will never be enough resources for enforcement. At the end of the day, workers need a paycheck and will continue to work under these horrible conditions. Recovering back wages and penalties is not a deterrent. Well, that seems like a comment, not a question. 
there's a question. Might... There's a question higher up in the chain from uh, Lu I've... Louisa Nazarino. Ah, here it is. Um, uh, Louisa Nazarino says, I'm interested in hearing David's view on Catherine's question about making a difference between uh, casual versus career contractors. Is there anything on his proposal that acknowledges that? Yeah, it's a great question and a great, great comment by Catherine. Um, in fact, Catherine and I served together on the National Academies of Science panel that looked at some of the inadequacies of actually capturing alternative work arrangement. And this issue came up a lot in looking at the data. Um, and that is, there is, there are, there are, I mean, as Catherine put it aptly, it's, it's great heterogeneity about people in these relationships. Um, so conceptually, I get it. Practically, I think there's a problem. I think, and, and, and Becky's presentation really laid this out. Every time you create a, an exemption for good purpose, unfortunately, it gets pushed into something distorted into something that then becomes the way people get around the regulation. Um, you know, I think of regulations as, as bubbles in the carpet. If you stomp it down in one place, it's going to pop up somewhere else in the room. And so you have to think about how the carpet's laid out. To me, the problem we have is we have defaulted so long into eroding our workplace relationships. So the tie goes to the employer rather than the worker. Um, we need a period of time where we move back. And we had a period of time like this in the post-World War II era, where I think the, the comprehensive regulations and systems we put in place worked more towards helping to establish rights and, and sharing of economic benefit with workers. And that's why we saw for decades productivity and worker earnings moving together. Um, before we start figuring out other ways to do these nuances, I think, in my view, we need to default more to recognizing the erosion that has taken place for working people, which would include sometimes maybe being a little over-inclusive um, uh, and, and dealing with the consequences of that. I mean, I always find businesses are pretty creative in dealing with those consequences uh, and still being able to make profits and, and maybe treat a larger group of people as employees that might be particular, you know, totally optimal. Thank you, David. We have three minutes left. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Is there any research that calculates the return on investment for spending on enforcement? In my state, wage theft penalties go to the complainant, so there's not a huge incentive for our state to allocate any additional resources. I, I know that's not the case in other states, certainly not in Tennessee. Any responses? Or Matt, you, yeah, you might have some insights here. In, in Wash, Washington State does something like that, where uh, every year they do a, um, a fraud enforcement report, and they'll put in there uh, what the return is for every investment dollar. And over the years, it has ranged from uh, every dollar brings in eight to 10 plus. So that's one, the only state I know of that, that does that. Um, and, and I had a question for the group. Uh, does anyone have, uh, other than Frank Newhauser's reports on workers' comp cost shifting in, in California, does anyone know of any reports on the, uh, the dollar volume of cost shifting because of this problem onto law-abiding employers? Apparently not. It's not. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we're at uh, four, uh, 544, uh, so we have less than a minute remaining. And I think we're at a good point for me to uh, um, give my applause to the presenters and the uh, uh, discussants and thank uh, all those who were attending and those who uh, offered questions that got on the Q&A uh, panel uh, session or block. Um, uh, this is, uh, a, for me, a remarkable uh, learning experience and, uh, and and I thought I knew something about this already. So uh, thank you all and uh, best wishes for uh, 2021. Uh, I know this is being recorded. 
and I'm not sure uh, where the availability will be, but we'll try to get uh, information about that recorded session uh, out to everybody. Uh, thank you for participating. Dale Bellman has his hand up. Dale? Yeah, uh, I, unmute, Dale. Uh, I was going to say, you should have a uh, link to a continued a Zoom site where we can continue this as a discussion, especially for panelists and uh, discussants. Uh, I sent that to chat. You sent it to chat. Okay. Yes. I will look for that and uh, maybe we can uh, uh, re regather uh, at that site. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, best wishes to all. Bye-bye. Uh, and thanks to all those who attended. <laughs>